Hello, everyone, and welcome to reInvent. Hope you guys are having a great time. My name is Michael Labib. I'm a principal solutions architect here at AWS. And I'm super, super excited to be talking to you guys about Amazon ElastiCache. So today what we're going to do is we're going to dive into the service. We're also going to look at various usage patterns that you can use with kind of injecting in-memory data stores with your architectures. So for our agenda today, we're going to start with uh, what's new. Then we'll dive into the service itself. We'll review some of those common architecture patterns. We'll dive into different caching strategies. A lot of people ask, how do you cache data using uh, Redis or Memcached? And then we'll uh, conclude with best practices. So gone are the days where you have one monolith database serving all your data needs, right? And for good reason. Um, with the diversity of usage patterns and data access patterns, uh, essentially, uh, you really need a database that's, that's optimized and purpose-built for a particular use case. And uh, in the case of ElastiCache, it sort of fits in the in-memory space, um, partly because the data is in memory. And because it's in memory, it's incredibly fast, um, orders of magnitude faster than retrieving data from disk. And in addition to the speed, um, you, you have uh, specialized data structures that can really augment your applications and architectures and really speed up things um, with respect to uh, those use cases. And speaking of speed, you know, when you're building an application, um, typically you know, speed is one of the things that should be one of your, your top design principles, right? So you'd be hard pressed to think of a use case that you want to build a slow system. And uh, you know, the opposite is true, and, and that's partly why we see such a, a demand for in-memory data stores. And it's not really a sort of a binary, you know, do I choose in-memory or do I choose a different type of database? It's really to augment your architectures. And we're going to really dive into that when we look at the architecture patterns. So what's new? A lot is new with the Redis and MemcacheD engines. Uh, Redis 5.0 is out, huge, huge announcement. Uh, so Redis Streams really being the highlight of Redis 5. Uh, Redis 5 is supported with ElastiCache. Um, the other thing that's new with Redis is sorted sets sort of gotten, got married with lists. Um, so if you're familiar with both of those data structures, sorted sets can now do pop and block capabilities, which is pretty awesome. Um, Memcached 1.510 is out, also supported with ElastiCache. And, and really, between both of these engines, uh, a lot of optimizations, uh, enhancements to algorithms, things of that nature. I'm not going to have time to dive into each one of these, but if you have any questions afterward, please you know, let me know. So since uh, streams is such a big, big topic, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the value of streams. Before we can get into that, uh, it's, it's important to level set on how time series data was sort of um, built and used with Redis. Um, so uh, there was generally a few different approaches that you would take uh, with, with Redis uh, with respect to time series. The first one is you'd leverage a sorted set. And this is probably the most common approach. Um, and so the way you would do it is essentially a, a sorted set is you have a key, you have a collection of members, and each member is a, has a value and a score. And the score essentially allows you to rank the data. And uh, the score uh, for time series would uh, be, a, let's say, a timestamp. And that would give you the capability of you know, uh, sort of sorting the data either by ascending and descending order. The problem with using a sorted set is that, uh, you know, number one, the values have to be unique. Right? In the time series use case, you, know, you might have duplicate values. Right? And so having a constraint on the uniqueness is, it could be problematic. Uh, the second one is the scores themselves uh, can uh, be modified, right? So they're mutable. And uh, that also can be a problem. So it's not truly a, a time series uh, data structure. Another approach is uh, using a list. Um, so a list is a, uh, obviously a, a key that's mapped to a collection of uh, members. And those members allow you to push and uh, pop um, values uh, in the, uh, uh, the order of insertion. Now, the issue with using a list is essentially you, you typically have one consumer, uh, and that consumer could be a, a blocking consumer that's just popping elements off the list. So there's no fan out capabilities uh, with a list, and there's also no way to uh, recover from, you know, say you popped a value and say that the message didn't get processed properly. It doesn't really have that true um, capability in, in terms of recovering from a message. Another uh, data structure that people would use is uh, PubSub. 
And so PubSub's not really a data structure, but it's a capability that's embedded in Redis. And uh, the thing with PubSub is uh, it does support fan out, right? So you would have a channel, and then you're, uh, you define a channel, then you have a, uh, you publish messages to the channel, and you could have uh, subscribers subscribing to that channel. And as they're subscribing, uh, you know, basically you're fanning out those messages. The problem is, is the data is not being persisted in a structure, in a data structure. So if a client is not listening to the channel, it's going to miss the message, right? And so um, it's not really ideal for, uh, you know, uh, critical data or truly, uh, you know, message-driven data or time series uh, data. So the lack of, uh, you know, a true time series uh, data structure is really what birthed the need of a Redis stream. So I'm going to kind of dive into uh, the anatomy uh, quite a bit, and uh, we'll kind of break it down uh, to some degree. Um, so you have three concepts, right? You have a producer, you have the stream itself, which is the data structure, and then you have a consumer. Um, so from a producer standpoint, you can add a value uh, to the stream using the xAd command. Um, basically, syntactically, it would look like this, right? You define the name of the stream. In this case, it's called my stream. The star uh, is basically saying, uh, you know, Redis, hey, generate an ID for me, a unique ID. In this case, uh, the, the ID would always be a, a time with the sequence, um, so it's guaranteed to be unique. And then the message is sort of a pair with the message and the value. So as, as, as soon as I persist that into the stream, Redis returns back that unique ID. That ID would be used for me to know what was the last message that I persisted. So I can use that to iterate over the messages in the stream. Now, the stream itself is append only, right? So the data is immutable, right? And so uh, it's ideal for you know, capturing the true sequence of events. And in addition to that, um, you know, there's a variety of different ways that you can consume that message. In this, in this example, we're just using an X range. I'm saying, give me all the messages with the min max. Um, and so in this case, I got my message back. Uh, but there's a variety of other ways, and even more interestingly, is you can define something called a consumer group. And so a consumer, a consumer group is really a collection of consumers that are all participating in retrieving data from the stream itself, right? So incredibly powerful. And each one of these consumers is really just getting a unique value out of the stream. So in addition to uh, the Redis updates, uh, a lot of ElastiCache updates since last year, I'll kind of touch on some of the bigger ones. Um, so in place uh, version upgrades, say you're on uh, Redis 3.2 or Redis 4 and you're using cluster mode enabled or, 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 or not, uh, you can upgrade the version, right? And so you could do this without any uh, manual steps or application changes. And basically what we'll do is we'll uh, upgrade your replicas, and then we'll just fail over to those replicas. So we'll, essentially, we'll take care of that operation uh, for you. The other one is, uh, if you remember last year, we talked a lot about the R4s. Uh, well, now M5s and R5s are out. Uh, much greater performance uh, from the new version, the, the, the new version over the, the previous version um, in terms of uh, performance, uh, CPU. And uh, on top of that, what we've done, uh, and that's really the gray bar, is we added additional optimizations on those instance types. So just another, um, you know, uh, I guess, case for using uh, ElastiCache over running Redis on, um, you know, on a vanilla EC2 instance. But generally, what you can see out of this graph, if you compare like the, the blue, which is the previous gen R4s, uh, the gray would be the optimize on four ElastiCache uh, M5 R5s, you really see 144% throughput, additional throughput that you can achieve, which is massive. Another big announcement uh, is, uh, you know, previously we uh, uh, and still, you know, the standard configuration is 15 uh, shards, and a shard, again, is made up of a primary and up to five replicas, which make up a max of 90 nodes. Uh, we're, we're changing that, right? If, so if you really need, have the need to have um, much more, maybe larger data or a much larger cluster uh, use case, 250 node support is available today if you want to white, get whitelisted. And so if you can see, do the math, depending on how many primaries, uh, shards that you have or how many replicas associated to that shard, uh, you can have upwards to 170 terabytes of data in your cluster. That's massive, right? So, you know, uh, it might sound crazy, uh, but maybe not, right? Because 
people aren't just caching database uh, data anymore, right? It's not just database, it's not just session data, it's a lot of other types of uh, data, and we'll talk through that when we get into the uh, application architectures. And then in addition to what I just mentioned, a lot, expect a lot more optimizations that are gonna occur on the actual, uh, uh, the instances that we, we, uh, we host for you. And then we're also gonna support the rename command. A lot of you have shared um, that request that you wanna be able to hide you know, specific commands, maybe like the keys command that prevents your developers from you know, bringing down the, uh, the cluster. And then self-servicing, self-service patching. Uh, so we're gonna give you the capability of really selecting you know, within a certain window when you want those patches to take place. All right, so let's kind of level set. We'll dive into the service um, and kind of just break it down, make sure that we're all on the same page. So what is Redis? Redis is the most popular in-memory key value store in the market. And uh, you can check that, you know, just check uh, maybe DB Engines or other sites and you'll see the rankings uh, and what people are really saying about Redis. And they say that, and it's so popular for a lot of reasons. Um, and really, uh, you know, in addition to the speed, and you, know, you can see here uh, sub-millisecond performance, uh, on average, we see somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 uh, to 500 microseconds in terms of speed. But you have uh, additional things with, say, like Memcached doesn't have, which is really the HA, right? So you have HA, uh, you also can do backup and restore, you also have atomic operations, and then where it gets really interesting is the, uh, the additional data structures that you have. So if you're a developer, and as you're building your applications and you're thinking about the different objects and uh, you know, uh, uh, co uh, collection classes that you, that you use, a lot of these are familiar to you, right? So whether you're using a list or a hash map, a set, a sorted set, um, a lot of these are things that you're currently working with. So you no longer have to think about what type of, how do I serialize this, the data structure that I'm using in my current application? You can actually just persist that structure into Redis and operate on that structure, right? So it actually eliminates a lot of lines of code um, with respect to uh, you know, what's supported. And then the cool thing about having backup and restore is you can essentially up to 20 times per day as a soft limit, you can take snapshots, right? Create an RPO of the data that's in, in memory as well. And uh, from a syntactical standpoint, incredibly powerful. The APIs are very rich with respect to sorting, ranking, and a lot of different ways that you can manipulate data uh, and retrieve data in Redis. So additional background here. So like if you were to stand up, say, open source Redis on your own, uh, maybe in a dev, a POC environment, you might find it to be you know, relatively straightforward. But if you want to productionize that, there's a lot that goes into productionizing Redis. Number one is how do you make sure that this thing is truly HA, right? Especially if the data is, say, critical data or really, a, um, you know, it's a enterprise level application. It's also difficult to scale, right? Because, you know, if you want to change the sharding, uh, whether you want to add shards or remove shards, there's some limitations with open source Redis. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. In, a, in, a, in the next slide. And then um, from, a, from an investment standpoint, you know, how much resources you want to invest in putting people behind managing Redis. Um, and when you do the TCO on that, with uh, comparing that with a managed service, doesn't, might not make sense, right? And I'll give you one reason, is if you are hosting it on your own, you're paying for, say, data out between the AZs. Uh, so you have to add the data out charge plus the EC2 charge. And then compare that with just uh, the managed service, which does, doesn't charge you for that data out communication, right? And so generally, you'll see the price to be pretty similar, right? And so with Amazon ElastiCache, in addition to us hosting Redis, we're very uh, much invested into the engine. We have uh, developers who are contributing. Uh, we actually just, uh, last year, we contributed uh, encryption in transit uh, to the Redis community along with other bugs and fixes and things of that nature. And we have a lot, if you think about you know, the, our platform, we have so many um, clusters that we manage, and so we see this at massive scale, and we've really tuned uh, ElastiCache to fit a lot of these needs, right? So 
Um, uh, one thing uh, which we're going to talk about is you know, how we um, shard data, and that's coming up in the a, in a, in a, in a next slide. But the other thing is really removing the headaches with respect to making sure that you know, the data is encrypted, um, the, the, manage, the manageability of the data, making sure that you're patched and, and racked, and all that stuff sort of just goes away uh, in a managed service. So use cases, um, if you're new to Redis, you generally start with um, caching. Right? But as you expose those data structures and you think about the different ways that you can utilize Redis, what we typically see is caching becomes you know, maybe the second uh, you know, most common use case. And people start using Redis to, whether they be a buffer behind uh, ingesting data, a fast ingest layer, or maybe they want to do a leaderboard. And so in this uh, slide, it says gaming leaderboard. But the reality is, is there's, you can have a sales leaderboard. You can have a leaderboard that's really just ranking various types of data, maybe most popular activities uh, to your, uh, your website or products. Um, could be Twitter uh, feeds. Um, so really, a leaderboard is just leveraging a sorted set. There's also geospatial capabilities. We'll talk about that. But essentially, Redis allows you to, to uh, you know, pass in a longitude and latitude and do like a georadius uh, command to really identify uh, values or members that belong to a particular um, geography. Uh, we see a lot of media, media streaming, really just whether you're putting portions of the media into, you know, maybe a byte array into uh, Redis, or whether you have links to other media and content. Session stores, chat applications now just became a lot easier uh, with Redis streams. Same with uh, message queues. Uh, people use uh, lists for that. And uh, we're seeing a lot of machine learning use cases as well. And so this, uh, the use cases make a lot of sense any time that you really need to augment an architecture and make something run a lot faster. And so this, this slide is really just giving you an idea of the different types of organizations that we have using ElastiCache. And if you just think about the verticals, you can imagine the different types of use cases uh, that they might be using it for. And a lot of them have to do with the previous slide that I was just discussing. All right, so with Redis, I'm going to level set on the different types of topologies that you have, just so you can understand uh, what's available. The vertically scaled topology, some people refer to this as kind of the classic mode. Um, vertically scaled, what it really means is all your data resides into one node, right? And so you have a primary node. And uh, for every primary, you can have zero to five replicas, right? And so the largest size cluster that you can have is whatever data you can fit in the largest instance type. Now, in this type of topology, um, you would have an application that would, that would connect to your primary endpoint. And then you might have another connection uh, from your applications that's, that's connected to your replica endpoints. Right? So um, you would scale your reads off your replica endpoints, and then you have your primary for your writes. And uh, you know, generally what happens is, uh, depending on the way your client works, um, you know, there would be various options with uh, you know, how you want to do connection pooling and how you want to discover those replicas, um, because the replica endpoints are not persistent. Now, the other uh, topology, and this is where we're going to spend most of the time, because most organizations are actually moving into this topology, um, is the horizontally scaled topology. And uh, one of the reasons why it makes a lot of sense to move into this is because you can have a one shard uh, cluster mode enabled topology, which really is the equivalent of having one primary uh, with you know, the same amount of replicas in the vertically scaled topology. The added benefit, though, is that you can change the amount of uh, shards that you want in this topology with zero downtime. And I'm going to talk about that in a, in a later, later slide. But what horizontally scaled topologies really mean is that rather than all your data, that entire key space belonging on one, uh, one node, you're dividing that key space into shards. Right? So let's assume that you have four shards. Um, the concept of a slot is essentially uh, there's 16,384 uh, slots. And then that slot would be used to decide what range of uh, what hash slot range would belong to each shard. And then the anatomy of a shard essentially is the same thing. You have a primary, and then you have a replica that, that, is, uh, that corresponds to the same hash slot range for that particular shard. Now, where this is different, in addition to the partitioning, 
is also in how you connect to Redis and how you talk to Redis. So what happens is if you're using a cluster-aware client, um, the client itself, you can map it to talk to the configuration endpoint, so we expose that rather than a primary endpoint. And in the configuration endpoint, when you talk through that, the client, depending on the implementation of the client, it's essentially going to do a cluster slots info uh, command behind the scenes. It's going to get a map from Redis what the topology looks like. And the topology is what are all the shards and what are the hash slot ranges associated to each shard. And it's also going to have like a flag on which one would be a primary, uh, which one would be a replica. Now, once it has that map, that map is stored locally in the client. And the client then knows that if I were to do a get set type of operation, the first thing that it's going to do, it's going to execute a circ 16 mod function. And it's going to, based on the output of that function, it's going to know where to send the, the key, right? What shard does that key belong to? And if for whatever reason the topology changed um, after the, after the, the cached uh, map, the, uh, the, the client would generally refresh its map, right? So that's an implementation detail of the, the client. And some clients also will frequently ping uh, Redis in the background. So the takeaway here is that when you build a cluster mode enabled cluster, you're basically deciding how many shards you want, how many partitions do you want of your data. And then you can also, by default, it's equally distributing the hash slot ranges on that cluster. But you can also do a custom um, distribution if you wanted to. And so you can say, I want just this range on shard one, and maybe that range on start, uh, shard two. And you might want to do that if you, had, if you wanted to isolate some keys onto a particular shard. And then you can always check when you do this, you're essentially, uh, you should see, an, depending on the distribution you pick, you can see the current items uh, in each one of those shards just using the CloudWatch metric. Um, uh, that we expose. All right, so just kind of a quick recap with this slide and the next. Um, the value that you get with cluster mode enabled, number one, is you have additional nodes, right? And so additional nodes, what that really means is you're able to add more memory. You're also able to scale your writes. You're also able to scale your reads uh, much more effectively. Um, you also have uh, more connections, if you really needed to support a lot more connections. They both support the open source client. There's nothing unique about ElastiCache with respect to connecting to it. And um, the other added benefit is the, uh, the failover time. So I mentioned earlier that if you were in cluster mode disabled, you get a primary endpoint, and that's a persistent endpoint. With cluster mode enabled, you're dealing with a map, right? And so what that means is there's no DNS updates or propagation that needs to take place. So failover takes a lot faster. And then the other thing that's great is that if your data is partitioned, let's say you had 10 shards, and one of the shards had a failure, only 10% of your writes are impacted. I mean, you could still read, because if you, assuming you have a replica, but then uh, until that failover takes place, which could be uh, you know, up to 15 to 30 seconds, and then you can start writing again, but it's much faster than that vertically scaled topology, which also needs to do the record set changes. And then from a price standpoint, um, they could be very similar, right? So it's kind of, um, you know, you have to do the math, uh, but essentially what happens is, you know, where you would normally scale up, now you're just choosing the smallest instance type that supports the network bandwidth that makes sense for you. I would highly recommend the new R5s, M5s. And then pick, the, pick maybe a smaller size that makes sense to have multiples, right? And again, you can do the resharding capabilities uh, with uh, online resharding. All right, so just to kind of break down the anatomy even further, so a shard, I mentioned earlier, by default, you can have up to 15. This is the assuming you're not whitelisted. Um, so 15 shards, and again, a shard is made up of a primary and a replica. We're doing a synchronous replication for you. If you want to see what the replication lag is, that's another CloudWatch metric. And then the replica is optional. You can have either uh, no replicas, or you can have up to five per each shard. And so assume that a failure happens. We're managing this for you. There's no Sentinel. There's no additional tools that you need. Uh, we'll detect the failure, and it will, uh, uh, will, uh, will essentially we will um, elect 
one of the replicas with the least replication lag to be the new primary. And it will send off a few SNS notifications in case you want to consume that and maybe do some reporting. Um, and again, this takes place in roughly 15 uh, seconds. And then you can still read from your replicas, right? And so that's a, another thing to keep in mind. And also to look at when you're choosing what client you want to use, because some clients make this really easy uh, where you can annotate and say, hey, you know, send my reads there, my writes there. Now, with online resharding, and basically what this uh, slide just showed is that you started with three, and then you wanted to say you wanted to move to five. This is a simple API call. And in this particular case, I'm scaling out, right? And so where this is different with Elastic Cache is that we do a slot-by-slot -slot migration. Now, the, op the ownership of the request is still at the source. And it's just until the entire slot has been migrated to the destination, then we, uh, we start sending the traffic essentially to the, uh, the new shard. Now what this gives you, because you're doing, we're doing slot by slot, is we give you the ability to still execute you know, your Lua commands, your mgets on that particular shard, whereas with open source, it might suffer from that because there's that split slot scenario, right? And so that's one. The second uh, advantage is that uh, this is a much easier, more reliable way to shard data, um, and so it's easier to recover from. There's no manual intervention if during the resharding capability something went wrong. Uh, that could be problematic um, if you were doing this on your own. And then the other added benefit here is that there's no application changes, right? So this is happening behind the hood. You're not seeing this. Your application is still connecting to uh, and writing and reading from the cluster. The cluster is still knows which is the primaries and replicas. And then once the slot changes take place, it's going to modify its map, and then your, your application will know where to direct the traffic. Now, the only thing that I will mention is that this might add a little bit of latency, uh, up to 20% latency. But again, we're, we're talking about an in-memory data store. So where you're initially at 400 microseconds, maybe now you're at 600 microseconds. And then the same thing is true for scaling in, right? So you have the ability to change how many shards that you want, whether it's out or in. And this is great, especially if you don't know how many shards you need. Or if you know that there's an event happening, maybe you're a retailer and you want to prepare for the holidays or you know, Black Friday just passed or Cyber Monday, you have that ability to plan in advance right, very easily uh, with no downtime. Now, because you can do this, right, there's no reason why you can't automate a process, right? And so I'm always about automation. I always talk about automation, especially with CloudWatch metrics that you should be concerned with. In this particular case, um, say, for example, uh, you were watching a particular metric. Maybe it was memory. Maybe it was engine-level CPU utilization. Um, if it met your threshold, um, kick out an SNS notification, trigger a Lambda function, and that Lambda function can execute a shard, uh, a resharding command, um, and essentially modify the cluster with whatever additional shards make sense for your topology. Now, this is not going to happen instantaneously because there's a lot of you know, data being moved around and you know, operations moving around, but at least you know it's happening durably. And uh, you know, just account for that. Uh, uh, you know, account for the timing, so you might want to be a little bit more conservative with respect to when that threshold is met. All right, so let's kind of dive into some architecture patterns uh, that we see, uh, at least common ones. First one is caching, right? And so this caching slide is obviously showing you a lot of different ways and back-end data stores that you can cache. And I'm showing this because a lot of times people are just so stuck on, you know, databases. Well, the reality is, is you can cache anything that can be deduced or you know, um, brought down to a data structure or even bytes, right? So uh, Redis is binary safe. And so what you can do is really put Redis in front of anything that you want to reduce pressure from or anything that you just want to speed up. Maybe it's a web application. Maybe it's a you know, some kind of experience, maybe it's a buffer, maybe it's something else that you want to augment and inject performance, right? And so I'm going to highlight in the caching uh, portion of this talk S3 and in a relational database. But if you have questions about how do you cache any of these other data stores, just let me know. Uh, but the most important thing to be aware of 
is that you know, you'd always want to make sure that your cache uh, and the validity of the data that's in the cache corresponds to you know, a, a, a freshness factor that makes sense for your, for your workload, right? So knowing what the frequency of change of the underlying data and then applying TTLs that correspond to that uh, data make a lot of sense. And we'll talk about that as well during the, the caching portion of the, of the talk. Another use case that we see is uh, sentiment analysis. So imagine you're, you're consuming a lot of fast-moving data, whether it's clickstream or Twitter feeds or whatever it is. Um, you can have a lot of different ways to you know, uh, consume. So in this case, I'm just showing a, a few different options. But at some point, you want a, a, a data layer that's going to persist that information or buff, bu be a buffer to the data that's being adjusted. A lot of people use Redis for this, right? Because Redis can support incredibly high throughput, low latency, and you don't pay for throughput costs. You don't pay for request rates. Um, basically, what you're paying for is the instance pricing. And so what you can have is um, you know, consume that information, whether it's in a list or Redis streams, which we just talked about. And then you can have consumers or multiple consumers peeling records off of the, of the stream and then sending those records at whatever frequency that you want to other places, maybe to do sentiment analysis with Comprehend, maybe to do a leaderboard as you're seeing these tweets or the click streams taking place. You want to see what the activity or the ranking of those items are in the, in the, uh, in the feed. And then another option is you know, maybe sending that data to your primary database somewhere else. Right, so that's the another. Uh, that's where DynamoDB is sort of fits in. It's kind of a strange sound here. You know, that's what that is. <laughs> right, I'm just going to ignore it until somebody shuts it off. All right. So, and then the other one is uh, using IoT data. Uh, so we get this quite a bit. Um, with IoT data, you know, you you obviously have these sensors. You're consuming data, you know, from various places. Um, AWS IoT Core makes this incredibly easy uh, to do. And then as you're consuming this data, you might have a rule that's saying, saying you know, for, for specific type of information, I want to send that data to Redis. And then maybe the other data, the raw data, I want to have a historical view of all that information and shove that into my data lake, maybe S3. And so we talked about the different ways you can deal with time series uh, data with Redis. Um, again, Redis Streams here makes a lot of sense. And in sorted sets would be the, uh, the other option. All right. I'm going to ignore that. <laughs> All right. So uh, the next one is real-time kinesis filtering. Uh, so we get this a bit. Whether it's kinesis, whether it's Kafka, it doesn't really matter. So assume that you're grabbing or you're processing a lot of uh, streaming data, fast-moving data. But as you're processing that information, um, you want to see if Maybe uh, similar information was already persisted right, into, uh, into Redis, uh, because maybe you want to decorate that information. right? You see a particular customer, a particular tweet, query the cache, the in-memory cache. Oh, I see some rele uh, relevant information there. What I'm going to do is decorate the information and then send that into a process, maybe a cleanse stream. Another way is uh, deduping information, or making sure that you just have unique uh, information there, or uh, maybe some other counters that you're taking place. Redis makes a lot of sense, again, from the cost perspective, the speed perspective, and the, the variety of data structures that are supported. Mobile. Um, so mobile, especially with the geospatial capabilities and the caching uh, as well. So you have a mobile application. Maybe you want to build a recommendation engine. Uh, so you know, I'm a user. I'm on my mobile phone. Uh, you can pass up my longitude latitude. Uh, that will hit maybe your API, API gateway. It will trigger a Lambda integration. Hit Redis. Send my, my longitude latitude to Redis. Execute a geo radius command. And then have Redis send you all the points of interest back to your user. Right. So uh, what are the places within a mile radius of my current position? Makes a whole lot of sense. Now, in this particular case, Redis would be augmenting uh, the backend data store, which in this case would be Dynamo. And then you can have a nice right back pattern where you're constantly refreshing and updating the cache by just triggering off of a DynamoDB streams a Lambda function, right? So it makes a, a nice little process to keep your cache fresh 
And so this would be another case where you're showing Redis sort of augment another data store. And then rate limiting. Um, so this one is kind of counterintuitive at first, but then it makes a lot of sense, right? So especially when you're in a cloud architecture where you could, uh, you know, scale your backend uh, or your cloud environments, whatever the load is, or scale in, in some cases you might not want to do that, right? Especially if it's cost prohibitive or maybe you have a product where you're selling, um, you know, silver, gold, platinum, depending on the, the request per second. And so what you would do is uh, Redis also supports a counter. A counter is essentially the integer representation stored in a string. You could increment or decrement that uh, value. And so as the requests are coming in, you can check against that counter, and if, uh, you know, if, if your, your threshold wasn't met, um, then you can allow the API request to go through. If the threshold was met, then you would just send a response back to your user, hey, you exceeded the amount of uh, requests that you can do, please upgrade to the next package or whatever uh, makes sense for your environment. And then we see a lot of other sort of, uh, you know, uh, integration patterns, uh, graph, search, or just uh, another two common ones. I'll talk about graph. So with graph, um, you know, imagine you have this highly connected data. Uh, this, again, I'll use the restaurant's use case. And you want to figure out, you know, based on maybe some other person's liking, what recommendations uh, I should recommend to, to myself, me being a target uh, person. So you would check my, you know, m mine and that person that's similar to me and see what that person likes, and then grab that, those vertices or those restaurants um, and then send them over to me. But as you send them over to me, you might want to also send that to Redis and do a geospatial lookup and say, oh, based on those uh, restaurants and maybe there's attributes associated to those objects that say where the, the location of those restaurants are, you might want to do another geospatial query. Another one might be you want to see or you want to aggregate uh, similar likings of, uh, of people, and you want to aggregate that in one of the collections, maybe a hash map or um, a set in Redis. You can easily do that. Right? So they sort of make a lot of sense uh, with respect to uh, use cases. And then the other thing is you can obviously cache, right? So if you have a query that you're constantly querying, um, you can always uh, cache that information uh, as well, right? And then the other use case, uh, you know, would be search. So again, like imagine you have queries that you're hitting your, your, your back end, your search engine. You can cache the actual query, so the entire query string that you're, 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 you're hitting the back end with, and then the response that came out of the, the search engine, you can cache that. Um, another way that we commonly see people using uh, Redis with is uh, as a buffer. So imagine you have a lot of fast-moving data, you're consuming a lot of data, and then you want to process that information and peel those records off and sort of, uh, um, you know, whether you're using Logstash and then just output that information into the search engine. So basically, having Redis serve as a buffer uh, makes sense there as well. So I'm going to dive into uh, some of the caching uh, strategies. Uh, we get this question a, a lot from people, especially if you're new to Redis, how do you cache data? So the two common patterns, um, basically lazy loading and then uh, write back. Um, so with lazy loading, you always assume from your application that the data is stored in, in, in the cache. Whether it's stored there or not, we, there's a solution to how to put it there, uh, but you start with assuming it's there, and if it's there, great, that's called a hit. There's a CloudWatch metric that will tell you whether the data was found in Redis, so you can check the, hit, the, the hits, the hit count uh, in CloudWatch. Now, in this particular case, we're using, uh, we're assuming that a result set object was stored in, in Redis. So a result set object is what you'd get at a relational database. So I'm going to pass a key. The key would be, say, my query, my SQL query, or, or something similar to my SQL query. And if I get back some bytes, then I'm going to assume that that was the, the byte or the serialized interpretation of that result set object. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert those bytes into a result set, and then I'm going to return that back to the application, right? And so this is really nice because you can add a nice DAO pattern, pattern right in front of the, uh, your application. If the data is not there, you query your backend database, um, just like you would normally do. And then what you do is, after that, you'd shove that result set object right back into the cache. So you just serialize those bytes um, 
back down. Uh, basically, you, you convert your, um, your, your cached or your result set object into a byte array and then just shove that into Redis. And then uh, for the key, the key can be the SQL statement or a similar uh, uh, query statement that makes sense to retrieve the data. And optionally, you always have the TTL. So you can say for that particular query, I want it to be true for the next hour or day or 30 seconds. It's completely up to you. Now, what other people do, while the first approach makes sense if you want to offload pressure from the back end, you still have to do the while RS next and it kind of, um, you know, iterate over the, uh, iterate over the, the object um, uh, in the first approach. In this approach, as you're doing the initial iteration of the result set object, you can convert that result set object into a hash map. Now, the value with converting it to a hash map is then you can persist the hash map into Redis. And then what that gives you is the ability when, the, when you're, say, your API, you want to request particular properties of that row, you can say, for that particular customer, just give me the first name, last name, and an address, right? Because now you've, you've reduced that, that, that row into a map, and now you can retrieve individual properties associated to the map. So in addition to speeding up the back end, now you've, you're speeding up your application logic because now you're not dealing with iterating over a result set object each time that you're grabbing the data from cache. And so from the S3 perspective, same concept, right? Imagine uh, you assume that the data is in cache. For this particular example, I'm gonna assume that the data that's stored in S3 was a string. And so uh, I defined a, a, uh, a naming convention for my key name, which is the bucket colon the key, which is the object name in, in, in S3. If I get a value back, great. I'm gonna return that back and I'm gonna assume that was the cache value in S3. The value wasn't there, I'm gonna query S3 like I typically do. Um, maybe I'll get back a uh, S3 object content, a uh, 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 input stream, and I'll convert that input stream essentially to a, a buffer, a string buffer, and then again into a string, and then shove that into uh, Redis. Now, Obviously, there's other data structures and different ways that you can do this. In this particular case, I'm gonna take whatever value was in that file or that object and then make that a string and then shove that in my value into Redis. Now, with Redis, each value can have a, a, a max size of 512 megabytes. Now, you'd never wanna store 512 megabytes as a single value, but you could, right? Technically, you could. Uh, but generally, you would want to have it in a manage manageable size for each individual value. Now, the other thing that's cool about S3 is you can define this sort of write-back pattern that's going to constantly keep your data in memory fresh. So assume you, you're constantly, you're caching S3 and you're writing to S3. On those inserts, you can trigger a Lambda function, which is going to shove the data right back into Redis. So you, again, when you query the data in, in S3 out of, the, out of Redis, you're, and then you're also hydrating, proactively hydrating the data uh, back into uh, Redis. All right, and so one other thing I'll mention about caching is that with lazy loading, um, if you're just doing lazy loading, uh, that might make sense from a, like it, it might be a good cost uh, strategy because you're only caching data that's been queried, uh, but if the data is not there, you always have that, end of that first hit where uh, the data wasn't there, and then you have to sort of cache it. A little bit of over overhead uh, that you have to deal with. If, you are, if you're doing this write back and proactively hydrating the cache, what you might be doing is you might be putting data that is uh, never gonna be queried, right? But at least you're, pro you're increasing the probability that on the, when, a, when the request comes in, that it's gonna be found, right? And so in practice, what you wanna do is you wanna do a combination of both. So as you're proactively hydrating the cache, you wanna apply a, a conservative TTL that will make sense uh, that if the data is never queried, then just expire it. And then when, if the, the request finally comes in, then what you do is then just the lazy load will catch it and throw it into the cache. And then you wanna play with that and make sure that you understand you know, what exactly is an appropriate TTL value, and then what is the type of data you wanna cache, and that would be a, a good strategy. 
Now, as we're talking about data and throwing data into memory, um, you know, you always want to make sure that you sized your cluster to a good size that makes sense, um, that we're not overfilling memory. But if you ever did overfill memory, Redis is sort of polite with respect to adhering to one of your um, policies, your eviction policies or max memory policies, to the best of its ability. And so you have a variety of different policies to choose from. And I'll give you a use case where this makes sense. So imagine you're putting in uh, cache data, which is cache queries. And for those queries, you're applying a TTL value. And then you're also storing maybe a metadata uh, that you're not, you don't have a TTL because that metadata doesn't expire uh, maybe for months or you know, some other uh, you know, longer duration of time. What, in that particular case, if you ever hit an eviction, you probably do not want to use like an all keys LRU. Because an all keys LRU is going to ignore the, uh, the key, the TTL value associated to a key. And it's just going to look for the least recently used key to evict. Um, in the scenario I described, maybe the, uh, the volatile LRU would make better sense because when it does evict a key, it's going to choose a key that already has a TTL. So leave that metadata um, values alone. All right, so cluster size, best practices. Um, when you're first kind of thinking about what is the proper size of this cluster, the first thing you think about is storage. And when you think about storage, like let's assume you, know, you need 100 gigs of storage. The first thing to keep in mind is that Redis itself needs about 25 gigs of memory, or sorry, 25% of memory. And so by default, what we're going to do is we're going to reserve that for you. So at that point, your total cluster size now, you need about 125 gigs. I'm just giving, making up an example. And then assuming that you're just guesstimating, you're not exactly sure how much data you need, you might want to add a little buffer there. And then on top of that, if you're the DevOps person, you also want to make sure that people are using TTLs, because at the end of the day, right, you want to make sure that the data is fresh in the cache and doesn't affect you know, uh, your, uh, your experience or your customer experience. And um, you also want to make sure that you're, uh, you, 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 you know how to react to, the, uh, to a situation where you ever need to, to scale that memory. So that's your first plan. Then the second plan is uh, identifying what your load is. So Redis uh, can support incredibly high throughput um, uh, for each individual node. I mean, it's incredibly high amounts of operations per second. But even with that, you still want to have a good idea of you know, what's the balance between reads and writes. Do you really need, you know, maybe a, 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 how many read replicas do you actually need? How, what's your uh, percentage of reads versus writes? So you want to size that uh, appropriately. And then with writes, as you, as you need additional writes, you'll, uh, you'll want to add more partitions to increase or add more shards to increase your write throughput. And then the other thing is always selecting an instance type uh, that supports the proper network bandwidth that you need. And then, um, you know, lastly, um, that I'll talk about is, you know, as we, uh, we kind of talked briefly about the blast radius, the, the, the nice value that you have with partitioning data because only a portion of your writes are affected. Well, this, if you kind of extrapolate that, that logic and think about the different use cases that you might have in your, your system, um, if you wanted to sort of uh, isolate uh, maybe your caching workloads with your high ingest buffer workloads or queue workloads um, along with uh, you know, a, maybe a different workload, that might make sense. That further sort of protects your environment, doesn't affect the blast radius if a particular failure occurred. Now, the more isolation you do, obviously, there's more clusters that you have, maybe additional cost. What we generally see uh, people do is, um, is isolate by purpose. So all your caching workloads are in a, in a, in a cache kind of cluster and so on. Um, what I, I would never recommend is just have one cluster and just do everything on that one cluster, right? Because uh, there's just um, too much happening in, in one space. Now, I, now I talked about um, CloudWatch. Um, so these are some of the uh, metrics that you want to be aware of. I'll highlight the, you know, the ones that you'd, I would highly recommend putting an alarm on. So bytes used for cache, make sure you understand what, you know, what limit or threshold you, you want to be aware of how much data is actually being stored uh, in, your, in, in Redis. And then the cache hits and miss, uh, misses is incredibly important because at the end of the day, it's all about making sure you have a hit 
in Redis, right? So you can just check that, check your counts, and if the ratio is you know, anything less than 80, 90%, and that's a problem. That's, uh, there's room for optimization there, right? And that's really making sure that TTL values are appropriate. Um, engine level, engine CPU utilization. Uh, so that tells you how much CPU is actually used for Redis. And I would make sure that for that one, I would have probably multiple alarms kick off, maybe one at uh, 40%, you know, maybe one at uh, 50, 60%, and then at, maybe at 70%, maybe trigger that, that alarm to, to reshard, add more shards to re reduce some of the, uh, that pressure. Or it could be replicas, depending on what type of re requests are, are causing that problem. Um, evictions, so again, evictions means that you're overfilling Redis. Um, so in that particular case, scale out, scale up. You definitely don't wanna see evictions take place. And the same thing with swap. You shouldn't see any swap. I mean, this is an in-memory system, in-memory data store. So as soon as, as soon as you see some swap, um, you know, that, that essentially means that you, uh, you need more uh, memory. And so we have a couple other talks. Um, we had a Redis stream talk actually uh, just earlier today. We also have a workshop. If you want to get your hands on some Redis uh, Friday, if you're here on Friday, please come by. We'll also have some Redis streams uh, taking place in that workshop. And uh, again, hey, thank you very much. I um, hope you, you learned something new and have a, a great day today. Thanks.